Hello and welcome to the One Stop English podcast. Each month we bring together teachers, editors and experts to discuss what's going on in the world of ELT. I'm your host Sam Wadsworth. I'm a former teacher and current editor here at Macmillan. Joining me this month are Patrick Curry, Delta qualified teacher and editor on One Stop English. Hello. Becca Sanderson, former teacher and editor of numerous business and general English titles. Hi there. And Vivian Gillis, Delta qualified teacher trainer at Bell Cambridge. Hi. This month we'll be discussing using L1 in the classroom, teaching contemporary and archaic vocabulary, micro teaching in job interviews, and parsnips. And we also have an interview with Sylvana Richardson, head of teacher development at Bell Cambridge and staunch advocate of equal rights for non-native teachers. Right, let's get started. Um Becca, get us up to speed with bilingual education in California. Yes. Well, back in 1998, California voted in the English only approach in public schools. So this meant that bilingual programs for English language learners were banned. Now, bearing in mind that more than 2 million school children in California speak English as their second language, this was a pretty controversial move. 17 years on, a U-turn is underway and voters are being asked to overturn the law by approving Proposition 58, the Multilingual Education Act. In fact, San Francisco has already passed a resolution supporting the act with absolutely no opposition from the public, uh, which might be an indicator of the overall result. Um but this turnaround is due mainly to research carried out by the Stanford Graduate School of Education and San Francisco Unified School District where they examined student performance in different types of English language learning programs and found that and I'm quoting from the Stanford website university here while students in English immersion programs perform better in the short term over the long term students in classrooms taught in two languages not only catch up to their English immersion counterparts they eventually surpass them both academically and linguistically so i thought this was pretty interesting yeah. in terms of uh, elt and you know while i realize it's not exactly the same setup there's a definite crossover Um I mean if you think about your CELTA training you'll mm. remember that using your students L1 was something you were not expected to do so you know we learned techniques like instruction checking and concept checking to kind of navigate around that situation um so Vivian mm. as a CELTA trainer yourself can you tell us the official CELTA line on L1 in the classroom Well yes I think it hasn't really changed the official line is that L1 or sorry English should be mm. used for everything and if you can't use English to get it across to your students then you're doing it wrong. Mm. However I think that anybody actually sort of thinking about it logically realizes that um students L1 really has a place in the classroom. So officially yeah it's still run the same way mm. but um I certainly advise all of my trainee teachers that they shouldn't ban L1 they need to use it as a resource and rely on it to to support the students because it's a really unfriendly environment otherwise yeah absolutely it's yeah. a bit tougher when you're in a multilingual class however you know and this yes. works very well if you're teaching in the country whereas if you're teaching here in the UK or in America somewhere like that you've got a multilingual classroom it's a bit tougher uh-huh. but as long as you allow some kind of conversation between the students it's a, you know that's a way to get around it yeah that's that's interesting i mean yeah if you do have the same mother tongue as all your students which yeah which is often the case these days um what what do we think are the advantages and disadvantages of that of using L1 in the classroom i mean should we do disadvantages first anyone yeah i mean the obvious disadvantages you've really mentioned i worked in uh, london in the same school as patrick actually um and we had uh, multilingual classes so mm. it was really difficult i think one way you could kind of get around it is if you had sort of a french student when i was monitoring i could go, kind of go up and say i think it's it means this in french um but it is difficult for the whole class because it was mixed yes if it's mixed yeah well this is where something like google translate really plays in um you have a lot of students who translate things on their phones and again you're supposed to kind of frown on that a right, bit they're going a, to yeah, their google absolutely. translate so often and you know and especially having phones in the classroom yeah. so again the temptation is to stamp down on that but i think that it's actually that's more detrimental you know in a multilingual ca- lingual classroom i think support from um apps and things like that is actually really really useful and letting the students sometimes you might have two turkish students like two arabic speakers or something like that and 
allowing them to be paired together, mm. which normal methodology says they should be split apart, mm. actually can be more supportive that way. What about um, students, though, uh, translating for each other? Because mm. I've definitely had classes where you had two people in, in a language that I didn't speak, say Spanish or something, and mm. they would be trying to explain the rule to each other mm. or the word to each other. And I just have no idea whether it's correct. And it's really <coughs> sort of tricky as a teacher because you're kind of like, well, I want them to you know, speak to each other and explain it. But mm. I have no idea whether they're doing it properly or correctly. Yeah, I guess you lose control a little yeah. bit as a teacher, which mm. might not be such a good thing. I think the trick then is to monitor then in production if they're using the word correctly, you mm-hmm. know, and so you have to see, right. uh, sort of assume that something sensible is being said between them and then really check later on in the use of language to see how, um, to see if it's being used right. right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, mean, I think it depends a lot on the level of the class as well, mm-hmm. because if you've got a lower level class and they don't have the capability to explain something using um, alternative words, then translation can be fine because it's time-saving. Mm. But when you have a high-level class, often they, could mm. use, they have the uh, capability, they have the language to be able to explain the word using other language. All right, let's move on. Um, Patrick, I understand that Americans might not talk about daddocks and frog stranglers for much longer. Yeah, that's right. Uh, this, ne- this next story is about old words and new words. Uh, As listeners are no doubt aware, the English language is not set in stone. Um, Every year, old words which have fallen out of use are removed from dictionaries, while new words and phrases are entered into lexicon. Uh, Earlier this year, the Oxford English Dictionary published a list of new words which are being included in their latest edition. So today, I'm going to give you three of these words, and I want you guys to guess what they mean. Okay. Right, okay. Mm. Right, word number one is cheese ball. Cheese, cheese ball. ball. What is a cheese ball? Is it a type of crisp? Something edible, for sure. Mm, it does sound edible. Or like an idiot. Oh, no. Person. Yeah, somebody who's yeah, really slimy, cheesy. Yeah. Yeah. Cheese ball. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we're getting close. So cheese ball is an adjective or a noun. As an adjective, it's lacking taste or originality. Uh, as a noun, mm. it's a person who lacks taste right. or okay. originality. So what a cheese ball. He's a cheese ball. Yeah. yeah. Such a cheese ball. A massive Sounds cheese a bit ball. rubbish in an English accent, yeah. doesn't it? It does, yeah. Mm. Okay, number two is an acronym, YOLO. Uh, I know ah. this one. You only live once. Fantastic. Very 1.2 good. Vivian. Yeah. Yes. And word number three is a blended noun, yoga lattes. Oh, well, okay, when I first mm. read this, I thought it was um, an abbreviation of chocolate yogurts. So. <laughs> 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 yoga lutz. No. I see we get, yeah, I see where you're going with that. Not yoga and Latte Pilates. coffee. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what? Yoga and Pilates, yeah? It is, yeah, it's very good. It's a type oh, of okay. exercise. It's uh, yoga and Pilates. I've never tried it. Uh, I don't know if any <laughs> listeners have tried it. Um, I don't even know the difference. No, no idea, no idea. So uh, as new words arrive, uh, old words also leave the language. Uh, However, in the USA, there's a Dictionary of American Regional English, and it is doing its best to save some old words from leaving the language. Now, they've published a list of words they've identified as being on the cusp of extinction and have enlisted podcasters to uh, help save these words. So while we're not regional Americans, this is a podcast and it's about language, so perhaps we can help them. Uh, There are 50 words on the list, but I've selected just three words which we're going to use, and I want to see if you guys can guess the meaning. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Okay, word number one is actually an expression, and it is to be on one's beans water. (laughs) To be be on one's beans water. Correct. Does it mean, you know, like to be on your game? So he's really on his beans water today. Or maybe maybe it's like a sort of health food. Maybe it's like detoxing to be on your bean water. So he's actually on bean yeah, water. Like he's drinking bean water. Yeah. Okay. To be to be on your own, to be by yourself. Okay. Oh, yeah, to be... okay. Actually, Sam's Sam's closest there. This means to be in high spirits. Yes. Oh, so okay. uh, I'll give Sam a point for that one. Uh, number two is the adjective. It's an adjective. Sonzi. Sonzi. How do you Sonzi. spell that? Sonzi is spelled S O N S Y. Sonzi. Sounds pretty funky to me. I think it's Sonzy. quite like an adjective. Swanky, maybe? Kind of. Sonzi. Sonzi. Yeah. Looking Sonzi. What, like what a Swansea area of London. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Not Swansea, sorry. Son- Sonzi. Sonzi, yeah. right. Yeah, yeah it could be like Flash, you know. <laughs> okay. Look at those right. Sonzi cars driving past. Okay. Cars. Yeah, a positive like thing, yeah. Mm. It is positive. Uh, it actually means uh, cute, charming, or Ooh. lively. Huh? Okay. Very Sonzi person. Uh, finally, my personal favourite is number three is the noun pop skull. Pop skull. He's it's a noun. It a is a noun. Skull. A pop skull. Sounds dangerous. It sounds like a sweet for a mm. child. Yeah. Pop skulls. Pop skull. Like, is it just a pop skull? Headphones? Like headsets? Oh, pop it is, skull. isn't it? Yeah. 
Mm. It's an old word, though, isn't mm. it? Yeah, it is an old word. Worldy. Well, I'm going to have to give Vivian a half point there because oh. it, it is dangerous. I can't give Sam a point Machinery? because it's almost the opposite. No, it is, in fact, cheap or illegal whiskey. Ooh. Okay. Pint, pint, oh, pop your skull. skull. Pop your skull. Nice. Oh, I see. Pop I think skull. you did a lot of ice with that. <laughs> so, I uh, want to move on to a more important teaching note um, relating to this. What do we think about teaching unusual or obscure vocabulary, mm. either yeah. new words or old mm. words? How <clears throat> useful is it in the classroom? I don't know about how useful it is. Mm. It goes know. down well, doesn't it? Yeah, that's it. It's what mm. students enjoy. I think they really love it. And if you're talking about you know language being a sort of way to convey culture, which of course it is, then that kind of stuff's really useful, really interesting. Mm-hmm. But well, no, not useful. It's useful for conveying culture, but not really for communicating. So it depends what we're teaching them mm-hmm. for. What about the new words though? Kind of because um, I we we worked in a speaking school for a while, uh, Patrick and I, and uh, a lot of that is about explaining to them that we don't really say this. People don't really say this kind of chunk of language. Mm. Instead, people usually say this. And sometimes Mm -hmm. that was really kind of colloquial language. Is Mm -hmm. that good? Is that a good thing to do? Well, again, I think it depends where they're going to be speaking English. So generally, I mean, we know the statistics, most people we teach are going to be speaking to other non-natives. So teaching pop skull or raining cats and dogs or whatever, Mm. I mean, it's not going to be very useful. Yeah, so uh, here at Macmillan in the dictionary, we actually have uh, red words and starred words, and these represent the core vocabulary of the English language. Uh, They're presented in the dictionary in their typical context, along with collocations and grammar patterns, so they help people use the words accurately and appropriately. Mm. But I think for kind of a bit of novelty value, maybe a Friday afternoon in the class, it's nice and interesting to teach them novel, new vocabulary. Absolutely, yeah. But not as a, as a rule on, on, on a day-to-day basis. Yeah. But of course, this is very much up to uh, the teacher's personal preference. What about higher levels, though? Um, teaching them kind of beautiful synonyms and things is mm. a great thing, isn't it? Isn't that the best thing about our language is that we have all these synonyms and these beautiful ways to say the same thing? But I think that's useful. Right, that's mm. a good thing, isn't it? I think that's, there's a difference between that and idioms like raining cats and dogs which Mm. are not overly used yeah and if they're going to go and read literature for example that kind of stuff's really helpful again i think it always depends on the um you know the purpose of the of the class like Mm -hmm. who you're teaching while you're teaching them okay so listeners what do you think should we be making an effort to teach more interesting vocabulary email your comments to one stop podcast at macmillan.com Okay, next up we've got Warmer of the Month. Each month we challenge our guest teacher to explain a fun, communicative activity in no more than five steps. So Vivian, what have you got for us? Okay, well I've got something that lots of you probably will have heard of before. It's the classic alphabet game. Um, The reason I've chosen this is because it's got a really wide application and I've just come round to using it after um, doing some teacher training. Um, and you can use it in lots of different ways. I'll demonstrate the basic way today, and then maybe we can talk about some alternatives. Okay. Okay. So we've got uh, Patrick. You're going to be. You're going to go first. Thank you. Okay. And then you can follow next. Okay. Monica. Okay. So we have the alphabet behind us, A to Z, and as we go back and forth, I'd like you to name one country beginning with each letter of the alphabet. Okay. Shall we see how quickly we can do this? Okay. Okay. <laughs> On your marks. Get set, go. Argentina. Belgium. Cambodia. D- Denmark. Egypt. Finland. Georgia. Three. Hungary. Ooh. Iceland. Jerusalem. That's not as country. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. So, well, well done. <laughs> Okay, so what are the other applications? Like, obviously, with countries, with yeah. pairs as a competition. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So you can have um, two teams as a board race. So you have line people up at the board, and they have to get down to Z as fast classic, as they can. Classic, yeah. yeah, they love it. You can go round the room a bit like we were here, but round the whole yes. whole classroom. Less pressure like that. Yeah, mm-hmm. you can have teams of two, teams of three. You mm-hmm. can even try and use apps in the classroom. You know, that get them onto the IWB. Yeah, you as can well. do how many of each letter can you get? Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, that's really good too. And you can do it at all levels. You just have to. Decide side obviously lower levels you could have you know animals higher levels sort of adjectives mm. or adverbs mm-hmm. you can have words which collocate with each other as well all right brilliant thank you very much okay you're welcome it's now time for word of the month each month we discuss a piece of eot jargon and how it affects teachers so patrick why are root vegetables so important in elt 
Well, this is actually the answer to a question that many teachers have probably asked themselves, which is why do English language course books always cover the same topic? And why don't they tackle more controversial issues? Uh, the answer to this question is, in fact, parsnips. So to most people, a parsnip is a, it's a bland root vegetable. Uh, but in the world of publishing, the acronym parsnips refers to a list of themes and topics that ELT course books are not allowed to talk about. So Vivian, hi. can you tell me what the letters of the word parsnips stand for? <clears throat> so the topics are not allowed to discuss. Mm. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm going to assume one of the S's is sex. That is correct. One of the R could be race. It is that, not race, okay. no. Um, maybe I don't. Gosh, it's quite difficult. Um, oh. Swearing could that be one of the S's? It is not. I'm trying to think of taboo subjects here. Yeah, in fact, we only have one S. The S. Ah. The S at the end is to pluralise them all. But I'll give you a clue. One of yeah. them is a type of food. One of the people. Pork. Pe- it is. Very good. Yeah. So pork okay, is. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Sure. One of the taboo topics. Okay. Um, gosh. Okay. Politics. Is correct. Yeah. Um, alcohol. Mm-hmm. All right. Violence, maybe? We don't have a V in there. No, so. okay. Um, people go to church, people go to the mosque, people go to... Religion. Absolutely. I bundled that with politics. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, two more. There are two okay. more. What's uh, left? One of them... N uh, and I. Hmm. Okay. Something that people... Narcotics. T- it is correct, yeah. Okay. And the I I'm struggling with. Okay. Our final I is actually, I'm going to tell you this one, is isms. Oh, so, okay, like communism. Yes, or socialism. Okay. So that's the, uh, yeah, that's the acronym parsnips. Politics, alcohol, religion, sex, narcotics, isms and pork. These are topics which English language textbooks are not allowed to cover because they're taboo. Okay. So now you know. Absolutely. That's very interesting. Okay, let's move on to this month's interview. This month, Patrick is talking to Savannah Richardson about the native versus non-native debate, L1 in the classroom, and what makes a great teacher. Okay, so I'm here today with Silvana Richardson. Hello, Silvana. Hello, good morning. Hi, thank you very much for taking the time to come and talk to us. Thank you for having me. Absolute pleasure. So um, let's kick things off. And can you tell us a little bit about the native, non-native debate in ELT and uh, how it's affected your career? Sure. Interestingly enough, the native, non-native debate in ELT is not a new one at all. I, I, it's one that started almost or up over, actually, 30 years ago with uh, Peter Medias and the publication of his book, The Non-Native Speaker. Um, well, basically, the, the, the core issue is uh, this idea that's really very old, um, that came with, with a direct method, that if you can speak English, then you can teach it, and with the importance of teaching only in English. So this has led to 100 years of privileging um, native speakers as teachers over non-native speakers. And it came with a sort of um, damaging deficit view of those who spoke English, not as their mother tongue, but as another, as an additional language or a foreign language, as people who spoke a deficit version, uh, version of English, and therefore, you know, they, they should not, they, they were not the ideal teachers. That was the, the view at the time. So a long time um, that this view has been installed, if you like, in ELT. So what that has meant is that a lot of teachers who have studied English for a very, very long time, who have had the experience of learning English, and therefore a particular empathy and, and, and skills that were developed because of learning English rather than acquiring English, have been marginalized. And that has been my experience as well. I remember, particularly, this is important, uh, where you try and teach English in countries where English is the official or the home language. So when I came to the UK to live, um, it was very, very difficult for me to find jobs. And actually, I only have GCSE level, um, so secondary level Spanish, my mother tongue, and I was a, a professional teacher of English as a foreign language, and yet people were hiring me to teach my mother tongue, for which I had absolutely no qualifications and were uh, not uh, selecting me for interviews, etc., to teach the, the language I was a specialist in and a professional in. And I've seen the same, very same situation with other colleagues, you know, who had lived in the UK for about 25 years, 
spoke almost perfect English, were professionals, and, uh, you know, um, uh, directors of studies were saying, that's all very fine, but I don't want her in my school. Um, so um, also I know from, from other colleagues and stories of people who have told me that in other countries that where English is not the mother tongue, this is also a, a prevalent situation. So it's affected my own career uh, in the sense that by the time I came to live in the UK, I was a, a teacher trainer, and I had to start from scratch, and I had to um, um, do qualifications, um, like, for example, a diploma that I, I really didn't need because my own qualifications were strong enough but unrecognized by local employers. So it really did set me back for about, I would say, five to ten years. Okay, and so earlier this year you gave a, a very rousing plenary speech at Ayatefel uh, on this very topic, and um, it, got, uh, it got quite a reaction. Um, so were you, were you shocked by the reaction, or how did you feel, and, and what, were, what did people say to you afterwards? It was very interesting because I knew uh, before doing the talk that I was, uh, that I was touching a nerve that there was something there that um, needed to be said, and it was the right moment to say it. But, yes, I was completely surprised by the reaction. Uh, I did, certainly did not expect uh, such a, a strong reaction from people. And I think what was really important to me was the, the personal stories. Um, you know, when after the talk, a lot of teachers um, came to me and said to me, you absolutely described the situation in my country, in my state, in my region. Um, this has happened to me. It, it, how many stories uh, were given a voice? Uh, that was for me was very important. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was absolutely brilliant. There's a lot of interesting blog posts on it and a lot of people. The conversation got restarted and kind of put into the spotlight. Yeah. Um, so I suppose the next step is how to address it and what we can do about this situation. And I want to divide the next question into three three segments. So first of all, what can we do about this situation from a teacher's perspective? Mm. Um, I think uh, when you, if you're a teacher and you're a teacher whose first language is not English and have ha- gone through years and years of listening or, or noticing that, that there are privileges for the native speakers, you kind of grow up accepting that situation. That, that's the status quo, and that's it, and there's nothing I can do about it. And that's, I think, the first thing I'd like to challenge, that if, um, you know, if, if this is a moment to challenge it, it, it is, you know, um, uh, and there are channels to challenge this assumption. Um, so uh, the first thing I would suggest is read uh, the TEFO Equity Advocates Campaign, which is a website, and it's got a lot of ideas about what teachers can do. So some of those ideas are to raise awareness, for example, by using social media. So, uh, you know, if, if you are not very active in writing, but, you know, if you tweet or retweet any stories um, or, or any posts, you know, that advocate equ- equity for the non-native speaker, if you're more daring, write blogs, you know, posts, etc. cetera. Um, talk to the colleagues in your staff room, raise awareness of this issue. So also, um, for example, inset, you know, the semina- seminars or workshops on, on this issue so that you raise awareness in your school, among your other teachers, and but also your director of studies, you know, the, the people who, who, who are in power and have the power to, to recruit yeah. and select teachers. Yeah, speaking of which, language schools uh, I want to come on to next. Um, mm. How would you like to see uh, them take the uh, the debate forward, and what what could they do in terms of um, pushing equality? Well, I think the first thing is that <laughs> quite a lot of um, directors of studies and people who recruit uh, owners of schools uh, have yet to wake up to the fact that the non-native teacher has got a lot to give, and 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 that you know as long as as um, the, the important thing here is not uh, an accident of birth. The important thing here is um, who you are as a professional, you know, professional qualifications, uh, prof- you know, how good you are in terms of not just your language, of course language proficiency is important, but not just your language proficiency, your ability to teach the language, your ability to communicate with students, your ability to establish a good relationship, and all that um, is, is really very important. Um, and I think, uh, you know, um, schools and language schools sometimes privilege nativeness, even without a lack of qualifications. So it's about, first of all, raise those people's awareness that that is not acceptable anymore. Um, so that thing, uh, once you go over that, then it's about understanding people's qualifications. 
particularly where you run a, a, a multi a, a school that hires people from people from many countries you, you need to be able to understand that um not everybody will have the, the, the famous or the recognized um, British qualifications, you know, the certificate, the diploma. I don't want to name names, but, you know, they, 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 they started as British, but they have become international qualifications. That's not a, a universal route. You can have many professional, well-qualified teachers with different professional routes. You know, like, for example, some people study uh, teacher training for four years. But because they're not well-known, people, you know, read those qualifications on CVs and they just bin them. So it's about, um, I think it's about becoming more aware of how different routes work, what they are called, so that when it comes to reading a CV from somebody who's not you know, who has, it doesn't say certificate in teaching English or, or, or diploma. So what, what, what does that mean? And, and, and they give them the chance, you know, interview them, find out. Even a, you know, a certificate or a diploma is not necessarily a guarantee. Uh, yes, they take a number of, 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 if you like, of assessment criteria, but they're not necessarily the profile of teacher you want in your organization. So give people a chance and, and, and listen to these people. I would say for me, I mean, this is a, a something that, it's not just about the native and non-native issue, but the best test of whether you're the teacher um, you're hiring, uh, you, you, you're interviewing, is the best teacher for your organization is give them the chance to micro-teach, to teach for about five to ten minutes. And that's the best test. And that's where you see the really professional, good teachers that you want, and you can tell. Um, and that's what I would say to, yeah. to schools. No, that's a very interesting idea, actually. So you're seeing a snapshot of their teaching skills. Mm. but um, So it's about experience and about qualifications, not about birth certificate, obviously. Yeah. Um, well, finally, from a personal perspective, uh, here at Macmillan, what could publishers do about this? Is there anything you think of that publishers might be able to do? I think you're already doing very good work by, by you know, uh, uh, interviewing, uh, you know, and, and bringing this issue to the fore, like, like what you're doing today, um, um, and, you know, raising the profile. Publishing, um, uh, I would say, um, publishing more about um, this issue, but not just talking about it, but... Um, the related issues around um, you can't separate the native non native issue with what p- people who have you know who who speak languages other than English can bring to your ELT and that research has recognized this as very important, which is the use of the student 's own language and how people who can speak other languages can enhance the teaching and learning of English through the use of the student 's own language. I would like to see much more of that um, in for example in books. Uh, for, for students, in supplementary materials for students, in teacher training materials. At the moment, there are certain things, uh, such as multilingualism, the use of the student's own language, that in methodology, as I said, you know, there's not just one or two research studies, but there's overwhelming evidence that the use of the student's own language helps, you know, of course, in a principled way, helps, and it, rather than being a barrier, is a, a useful tool to learn foreign languages. And because you know, the, 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 the idea of the native speaker has been so important, particularly of the monolingual <laughs> nature, those who only speak English. You know, that pedagogy has been also marginalized, and I think it needs to be brought more to the fore. So uh, particularly, as I say, in teacher training materials, or supplementary materials, you know, give teachers a chance to understand why this is important and how to create not just a failed monolingual, but a student who's a multilingual user, a bilingual speaker of English, in, a to- in, a, in an increasingly global, multinational world. I think that aspect is not doing the student any favours, let alone the non-native speaker teacher. Oh, absolutely. Um, so it uh, brings me to my next question, um, which uh, I think kind of feeds in from your answer there. But how do you feel about using L1 in the classroom? Obviously, I think uh, there's, there's definite benefits to it. Uh, would, yes. you, would you encourage it through your teacher training? Absolutely. I mean, uh, as I said, principal and judicious use. There's a lot of research that says if you use between 4 and, and 10% in whole class interaction, particularly at the lower levels, there is absolutely no evidence that it increases the use of the student's own language. It actually doesn't do anything. So there's nothing wrong with, with using the student's own language. There's, there's also research that if the teacher uses only English at all times, it does not increase the, the use of the students, I mean, the students' use of English. So clearly, there is something there. There's also a, a research around um, the importance 
at the lower levels of using a bit of the student's own language to reduce anxiety. It, of course, if you're anxious, you can't learn English. This is well known. So, um, you know, the students feel anxious if you use only English, particularly at the lower levels. So, you know, it's very uh, – and also, I don't want to bore you with this, but I think it's important to, to bring it to awareness. Um, to raise people's awareness. The other thing is that, again, especially at the lower levels, uh, students need to make connections between the, the words and the phrases that they already know um, with the, the, the target language they're learning. And, and this thing that you need the language you know to learn the language you don't. There's a lot of research uh, in, in neuroscience now that we you know that we now know. So clearly, the message is you know um, in the right dose and at the right level and for the right reasons, using the student's language is an advantage. And the student's own language is a, a useful and helpful tool to, to help them learn English. So, yes, I am in favor of it. Of course, what it, if you like, the problem that it brings for the monolingual English speaker is that you need to learn the student's language. And you need to have some kind of functional ability to speak the student's own language. And, of course, it works better in monolingual. So where, where all the students and the teacher share a mother tongue or, or, or a language. It's more difficult to do in multilingual classes. However, it's not impossible. And, and, and there are some books that give very good ideas, like Philip Kerr, for example, that give very good ideas about how this can be done. So, yeah, totally in favor. Absolutely brilliant. Okay. And in your current role as a teacher trainer, mm-hmm. uh, obviously you see lots of different teachers in, in different teaching circumstances. From your experience, what do you think are the key ingredients to becoming a successful teacher? This is such an interesting question. And, you know, if I had a day, I could answer it in more depth. But uh, I would say, uh, first of all, um, a love for the language that they teach and a love for teaching and learning. It's very important to really, really love what you do because that is inspiring and is motivating. And a love... Uh, for students, you know, to be, want to be there, um, because if you if you really have a passion and an inspiration for the language that you teach, for learning and teaching, and for the people you have in front of you, you will really be dedicated, interested, curious, and want to keep learning, which is fundamental. Brilliant. So, love of language, love of students, key ingredients. Okay. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us. It's been an absolute pleasure. Oh, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure to talk to you, Patrick. Excellent. And, uh, yeah, very good luck with uh, continuing the cause. We'll uh, keep raising awareness and, um, yeah, see how things go. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Bye -bye. Bye-bye. All right. um, Great interview. Um, I'm not really sure we need to add anything more to the bigger issues that you guys covered, um, but I did want to ask you about micro-teaching in interviews. Uh, Silvana suggested that the best way to assess a teacher in a job interview was to ask them to teach a five to ten minute lesson. Do you think that's a good idea? Uh, personally, yeah, I, I do actually. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's just a great way to get a little taste of a teacher's style. Yeah, I just worried that five to ten minutes maybe isn't enough time to get into your teaching groove and kind of relax into the lesson. Right, and I guess I don't know if you get any preparation time or anything. That's mm. another question. Um, and has anybody ever been asked to do this? A friend of mine has actually quite recently in a job interview and she had time to prepare even before the interview. Okay, yeah. um, but she got to the class and all the interviewees acted um, as the students and she said it was a really difficult experience because they just acted like the worst kind of students. Of course, yeah. In a way that perhaps students wouldn't always necessarily behave. So I think it added quite a lot of stress to the interview. So I don't know how she would have... W- she did actually get the job, I should right, mention. Okay, yeah. But I don't think it was a pleasant experience. <laughs> Okay, let's move on to Teacher's Dilemma. Each month we describe a common classroom issue and ask our listeners to send in their solutions. Last month, Becca described the problem of students constantly turning up late to class and getting angry with the teacher for not letting them in. Listener Daniel Kinris sent in this solution. Daniel writes, After diffusing the situation, I would probably let them in with a warning and a brief explanation about the policy. If they're elementary level students, I would probably alert an administrator or some other support staff who speak the student's language, if available, to explain the policy. I would also need to follow up with the manager or administrators behind the policy. 
If it turns out that this is a recurring problem, then perhaps the policy is not appropriate for the school's cultural context. With that said, in an L2 setting with multilingual students coming from different countries and cultural contexts, a stricter policy will likely prevail. So that students from more punctual cultures and who have disapproving attitudes towards latecomers and possibly the teacher him or herself will not be disrupted by the latecomers. So thanks very much. That seems like a very reasonable solution, Daniel. Anyway, Becca, what have you got for us this month? So one of your students is confident, outspoken and keen to use natural sounding phrases like by the way and it depends on. However, they continuously make basic grammar mistakes and when you try to correct them, they shrug and say, I know, I know, but make no effort to improve. What do you do? Well, um, I think it depends why they're learning, as always, but um, I think for a general English student, my own personal opinion is I'm less worried about grammar. I think that if the student communicates well and they can be understood, particularly if they use a natural turn of phrase, I think that's a really good thing that should be encouraged, and so I'm less likely to pull them up on the grammar. If you're teaching in an IELTS situation, however, that really wouldn't cut the mustard, so you'd have to kind of um, explain to the student that this was a an important way to get through the exam but if it's just for communication purposes I don't think grammar is such a big point okay very interesting okay all right listeners it's your turn um, send in your solutions to this month's dilemma to one stop podcast at macmillan.com all right let's move on to Q&A the part of the show in which the panel tries to answer your questions okay first question this month is do you think having fun is an essential part of the learning process? Well, yes, of course, I think it is. I think having fun means your students are relaxed. If your students are relaxed, they're, they're taking more on board. Does it matter what type of class it is? If you're teaching, say, an IELTS class and you're teaching, you know, the writing about an academic process... No, I don't think so. I think fun, especially in that kind of maybe quite dry scenario, is really, really important. Yeah, I don't think fun necessarily has to be a game either, does it? It's just a, a, true, a yeah. lightness of That's touch, yeah. uh, your choice of the article or a video mm -hmm. clip, something like that. Yeah, I would couch that just by saying I think it depends on the context. So, for example, a business class uh, or Japanese businessman, they come with very, very uh, set expectations and they want to be doing something which is very pertinent to their jobs, which might not necessarily be fun. Well, yeah, but I think you can turn that into being fun. I teach a lot of business and a lot of businessmen on their own, and I think that even just having kind of jovial conversation, that counts as having fun. And surely, in general, if you enjoy something that you're doing, it's more memorable. Absolutely. All right, our next question is, a lot of teachers are unsure about how to approach error correction in class. So, Vivian, what's your advice? Yeah, it's quite tough when you're just starting out as well, I think, to know what to do. Um, I think that on-the-spot error correction is often much easier for novice teachers, um, but then, you know, that can be overused and can reduce confidence. So I'm a big believer in delayed error correction. But again, um, novice teachers or just people who have just started out, they don't really often know how to do that. So it can be quite a tough approach. Do you use peer correction? Because I think for higher levels, that can be quite useful because if they have say the teacher corrects a piece of writing, for example, and there's lots of red pen all over it, it can be quite uh, de demotivating for students, whereas if, they, if their peers are correcting um, someone of the same level... Absolutely. No, I really believe in that, particularly for writing. I think um, with peer correction, the key is to get the students on board, because lots of the time they only want to know what the, what the teacher has to say. So you have to teach them the, the importance of what they can learn from each other. And I think also it's worth identifying the seriousness of the error as well, because some, like you said earlier with grammar, grammar is not necessarily an impediment to communication, so you might not want to correct every single grammar mistake. Mm -hmm. OK. And last question. What is the most rewarding thing about being a teacher? Well, it's got to be when a student comes into class and says, oh, it was great, I, I watched a film last night and I understood everything, or I was in a business meeting last week and I used one of those phrases you taught me, it was really good. You know, it's just when they come and feed back to you and say, you know, how useful what you've taught them has been. Yeah, I think uh, I've got to agree with that. And also exam results, tangible uh, results when students come to you and they wanted to get a grade, when I used to teach anyway, and then they got that grade or better, that was a, it's a fantastic feeling for sure. Um, yeah, and on an everyday level, I think seeing your student leave the class knowing something they didn't know when they started the class is uh, really rewarding. 
Okay, well, that's it for another show. If you have any questions, suggestions, or feedback, please email us at onestoppodcast at macmillan.com. Thank you to this month's panellists. Thank you. Thanks a lot. A big thank you to our special guest this month, Vivian. Thank you very much for having me. And thank you for listening. And until next month, this is the One Stop English Podcast. <laughs>